Well, welcome back. Uh, I'm Jerry Clark and uh, we're in Romans. Uh, this is lesson nine. Uh, this will be my last week. Next week, you'll have Kelly. He'll be carrying through to uh, the next four lessons or to the end of uh, the chapter of Romans. I wanna welcome you all back. Uh, it's been an interesting week as we open up uh, to whatever is gonna happen these days. Uh, restaurants are opening up, uh, other stores are beginning limited opening up, and uh, you see much more traffic on the streets. And uh, so it's an interesting time. Uh, everybody questioning or anticipating of what's gonna happen over the next uh, few weeks. But we're here. Um, I was thinking about uh, this time and uh, how people react. Um, most people are beginning to get to the point where, hey, let's just open up and get on with life. And uh, it's funny how, you know, we've gone through this period of uh, isolation and being homebound and everything. And uh, we haven't lost our sense of humor. Um, in fact, uh, uh, I was looking at some, uh, there's been a lot of jokes and memes on the internet. And uh, uh, I looked at one, which I'll probably order as a t-shirt. Uh, once this thing is over, as a t-shirt that says, I survive the great toilet paper crisis of 2020. And I think that's something that people will remember most about this pandemic. In fact, I can imagine that uh, years from now, some grandchild will be asking his grandpa, how did you survive the great pandemic? And uh, how did you, you know, what were the, the greatest crises during this time? And, and the grandfather will probably say something like, uh, well, you know, it was the great toilet paper crises. Um, we had to use one ply for weeks. I still have nightmares of going into the grocery store and seeing these empty shelves of no toilet paper. Um, and I can imagine the grandchild probably saying, well, Grandpa, is that why you keep 100 rolls of toilet paper under your bed? And he'll say, yes, son. It was just such a uh, horrific experience uh, that I have to do that. It changed my life drastically. So I would imagine that we'll all have war stories that we'll tell our children, grandchildren, or whoever else as we come out of this pandemic. Uh, one uh, side effect of this pandemic is that uh, doctors are uh, thinking that there's gonna be a baby boomlet within nine months. Uh, people being uh, kept at home, uh, you know, looking for things to do, uh, that there is going to be an upsurge uh, in baby births in nine months. And thinking of that, I was imagining that in 2033, these kids will be in their quarantines. <laughs> Oh well, let's get going. We talked last week about the Holy Spirit, how the Holy Spirit gives us meaning uh, to our being adopted into God's family. How the Holy Spirit testifies together with our spirit that we are God's children. How the Holy Spirit is our down payment, our deposit on our glory to come. An ending is that our present suffering in this life, including this pandemic, are nothing in comparison to what will be revealed to us. Great words, great verses that I would encourage you all to uh, read on a fairly regular basis. Now, Paul ends this uh, uh, section of Romans, really with uh, Romans 8, 38 through 39, where he says, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So this is a tremendous climax 
to all that has gone before and our special relationship with God. And if that doesn't make everything that you're going through now seem smaller and less intimidating, I'm not sure anything else will. Now, as he goes into chapter 9, 10, and 11, you would think that he has built it up to where now he would be uh, taking on uh, the application of how we should live our lives as Christians. With all that has preceded this, he is now ready to say, okay, you're ready. Now I'm going to reveal to you some of the things that you need to be doing as a Christian. But he doesn't do that. In fact, it's not until chapter 12 uh, that he begins to uh, incorporate some of these things and build on the things that he had in the first eight chapters. Now, some uh, theologians argue that uh, chapters 9, 10, 11 uh, were added by Paul as an afterthought because it seems to interrupt his flow uh, in his discussion. Uh, he, in these three chapters, he really returns to a discussion concerning the Jews' advantage of knowing the gospel, but rejecting it. Uh, and I think the answer to why he did this is uh, the sequence of verses in uh, chapter 9, uh, verses 2, uh, 2, 3a, which is about half of verse 3. Uh, he says, I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, those of my own race, the people of Israel. So he is saying that he is willing to be separated from God, cursed, if it would mean that his fellow Jews, his race, for their sake, becoming delivered in the gospel news of Jesus Christ. Now, why would he do that? Uh, you know, uh, yes, he is a Jew and the other Jews. Uh, and I think you get a little bit, as I was thinking about this, I thought, well, remember Philippians 3, 5, and 6. Or 3, uh, 5 through 6. Uh, where it says that... Uh, whoops, I think I may have the wrong verses. Uh, but he says, if anyone else thinks he has reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews in regard to the law, a Pharisees, as for zeal persecuting the church, as for legalistic righteousness, faultless. So what he was saying here is that, yes, I am a Jew of Jews. I am a Hebrew of Hebrews. He was brought up studying the law. He was zealous for it. He became a Pharisee. And of course, his first big project, I guess, was trying to eliminate Christians. That was his zeal for the law of maintaining the purity of Judaism. So if he is that zealous for the law, when he became a Christian, he became just as zealous for that. And his thought was, I need to make sure that my fellow brothers and sisters hear the gospel and come to the same realization that I did. So he wanted the chosen people to receive the gospel, not simply because he was Jewish, although, like we said, that served a big part of it, but also 
because of Deuteronomy 7, 6, where God said, In verse 6, for you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of this earth to be his people, his treasured possession. So Paul is pointing out that God has chosen them. They are his treasured possession. He doesn't want to lose any of them. And so he wants to make sure that in his uh, spreading of the gospel, now he was primarily spreading the gospel to the Gentiles, that he wanted to include the Jews. And of course, whenever he went to a new town, the first place that he went to was the synagogue. And he preached to the Jews. And he said, in, uh, again, looking at chapter 9 and verse 3, uh, uh, the rest of that verse through verse 5, it says that the people of Israel, theirs is the adoption as sons, there is the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple of worship, and the promises Theirs are the patriarchs, and from them is traced the human ancestry of Christ, who is God over all, forever praised. Amen. So he is saying the Jews had everything. God gave them everything. He gave them the laws, the covenant, the promises. He took care of them. He sacrifices uh, that they did, and everything that uh, he gave them was to lead them to the gospel, to righteousness. Well, what happened? Well, if you look in chapter 9 and verse 30, Paul says, What then shall we say? That the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have obtained it, a righteousness, righteousness that is by faith. But Israel who pursued of law of righteousness has not attained it. Why not? Because they pursued it not by faith, but as if it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone. That is, it is written, See, I lay in Zion a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes him fall, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. So who is the stumbling block? Jesus. The Christ and what he did on this earth to redeem us. The Jews, the nation of Israel, would have been perfect <laughs> for recognizing the coming of Jesus. But they begin believing that upholding the law through obeying the law, through works, was the way to proclaim righteousness. Their works built around observing all of God's laws, plus 603 others that they included, as a way of obtaining righteousness. So we begin in chapter 10, looking at verses 1 through 4. He said, Brothers, my heart's desire and prayers to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. For I can testify about them that they are zealous for God, for their zeal is not based on knowledge. But their zeal is not based on knowledge. Since they did not know the righteousness that comes from God and sought to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. Christ is, Christ is the end of the law, so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. You would think that the nation of Israel would have been eagerly awaiting the Messiah, Jesus, 
They had the scriptures. They had them for centuries. They had people who spent their lifetime studying them and all the prophecies concerning the Messiah. Uh, you would have thought that as they saw these scriptures being fulfilled, that they would have been surrounding Bethlehem at the time of Jesus' birth. I mean, after all, the wise men figured it out. Uh, why couldn't they? Well, I think it says in these verses, they were zealous for God, but they didn't really think they needed salvation. The salvation they wanted was not a spiritual salvation. They wanted salvation from Rome. They felt they were being oppressed by the Roman occupation. So their view of the Messiah was this kind of salvation. They wanted another David who would organize an army and defeat all the foes and make Israel a nation unto itself again. They thought that they had broken the code to being spiritual, to being righteous. In verse two and three, it says, they were zealous for God, but they tried to establish their own righteousness through working to obey the laws. In essence, they were saying, if I can only be good enough obeying God's laws, then I will be considered righteous by God. So they were self-righteous, which means that they trusted their own works. I think they confused the word good with righteous. Uh, if I could only obey enough of the laws, the 603 plus the 10 commandments, if I can behave morally and responsibly, if I can follow the rules of my religion, uh, if I give what's required, if I can make sure that we don't have any of these false messiahs or teacher rising up, if I can keep it pure, then God I will be righteous before God. Wow. Do we do that today? Do we get righteousness confused with goodness? Um, do we think that, oh, if I can just be good enough that I'll go to heaven or God will reward me or I will be righteous before God. If I can just do the things that are required of me, um, if I can just be at the church when the doors open, if I can tithe or give my offerings or whatever, if I can uh, you know, read the Bible, do all these things, will I be good enough? If I can watch my tongue, if I can keep from getting angry or a whole host of anything, other things. In fact, you could probably look at the 603 laws that the, uh, the uh, Jews had and, and start going down that list because that's what they used. If I can just be good enough, then I'll be right with God. Well, let's look at Luke 18, verse 19. This was... Uh, when Jesus was uh, confronted by, we call him the rich young ruler, who had come to Jesus asking, you know, how do I, uh, I get saved? And he comes to Jesus and he said, a certain ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inher inherit eternal life? And Jesus replies, why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. Wow. No one is good except God alone. 
So if you're trying to be good, as the Jews were trying to be good, uh, it doesn't work. Jesus already said it it ain't going to work because no one is good except God. Only God is good in every sense. So let's look in, as he continues in chapter 10, verses 5 through 7. Moses describes in this way the righteousness that is by the law. The man who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that is by faith says, Do not say in your heart who will ascend to heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the deep, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. So Paul continues to contrast rightness from the law, righteousness from the law and righteousness from faith. And he starts bringing in some of the Old Testament passages. Because remember, the Jews you know, from a very young age were taught the scriptures. They knew these verses that, and events that Paul was talking about. So Paul was trying to reach a lot of the Jews through this Roman letter uh, and make them think on these scriptures to sort of bring them into receiving the gospel and showing them that you've missed something here. Being so preoccupied with the law, you've missed grace. You've missed the righteousness afforded by Jesus as he went to the cross and it was raised again. Remember, uh, there were a lot of converted Jews in the Roman church, uh, as well as the, the Gentiles. And I think he was sort of giving them the ammunition to use with their fellow Jewish friends who had not converted. I think he was showing them, hey, here are some things that you can bring and talk about and help them to have that aha moment where you can share the gospel with them, where the Holy Spirit can come into their lives and convict them that the only way to achieve righteousness was through salvation. So he uses a lot of the Old Testament passages. That's why I think on the board you'll see we sort of flip back and forth through some. I'm not going to use all of them. But in this set of verses, he used the quote, who will go up to heaven? And uh, or he said, do not say in your heart, who will go up to heaven? This came from Deuteronomy 9.4 and Deuteronomy 30, some verses in there. And it was the time when Moses was inspiring or impressing on Israel their excess access to God and His commands. Israel did not need somebody to go up to heaven and grab the commands and bring them back to this earth. God did it. <laughs> you know, he had already come. Uh, and he re- subtly reminded the Roman, uh, Roman church that Jesus had already come down from heaven. You know, Jesus, just as God came down and gave Moses the Ten Commandments and the other uh, laws, Jesus has come down and fulfilled the law. Next, Paul asked, who will go down into the deep or the abyss? Uh, that's from Deuteronomy 30, 13. His point is that Jesus had already been raised from the dead, so no one was needed to bring him back. What he's saying here is it had all been completed. There was no need to, you know, go back up to heaven and, and get something extra and bring it back. There was no need to go to the depths and get something extra and bring it back. It was all there. It had been completed through Jesus Christ. And Paul is telling the Jews that through the Old Testament scripture, that Jesus was the completion of God's work. Nothing further was needed. He had come to fulfill the law. So in Romans 10, verses 8 and 9, 
Paul continues and says, but what does it say? The word is near you, it is in your mouth and your heart. That is the word of faith we are proclaiming. That if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's a verse most people recognize, that verse 9. Uh, he is telling the Jews that everything has been provided to God to attain spiritual rightnesses, righteousness. And he uses Deuteronomy 30, 14. And I think that's one of the verses that I was looking at. Because it says in Deuteronomy 30, 14, that says, No, the world is very near to you. It is in your mouth and in your heart, so you may obey it. Heart and mouth. So Paul was using this Old Testament scripture to give it a gospel inspiration because what happens? Don't we confess with our heart and our mouth? You know, it's not two separate processes in the, uh, two separate steps in the process of salvation, but it's two aspects of a single confession. Now, the word confess here means to agree that something is true. And in fact, when we look at this verse in Romans, where it says to, uh, oops, where it says in verse uh, 9, that the words confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. That's the oldest confession, confession in the uh, early church. Uh, it was used throughout the churches and they would confess or say that it was true that Jesus is Lord. So Paul is urging the Jews and also uh, unbelievers to confess and believe. Then he moves down to verses 10 through 12, and he says, For it is with your heart that you believe, and you are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confessed you are saved. As the scripture says, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. Paul states that with this heart belief, righteousness resulted and salvation resulted in confession with the mouth. It's a, a new relationship. And he says, uh, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. It's like saying that your trust, your hope, your faith that you put in Jesus Christ will never disappoint you. No one who puts his faith in Jesus Christ will ever be disappointed. Isn't that a great thing? <laughs> I have been disappointed in life. I'm sure you have too. But if your faith is in Christ Jesus, you will never be disappointed. In fact, he says in Romans 10, 13, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And this comes out of the Old Testament. It's uh, Joel chapter 2, verse 32. Joel 
if I can find it real quickly. Well, I won't continue looking. I thought I'd marked it, but maybe I didn't. But anyway, what it says, it says almost the exact same words. It was saying that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It was a phrase out of Joel uh, 2.32 at, uh, at the end of the description of God pouring out uh, His uh, Spirit on the day of the Lord. It same, the same verse was used by Peter on the day of Pentecost to explain the coming of the Holy Spirit. Because everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now Romans 10, 14, and 15. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? That is as written, how beautiful are the feet who, of those who bring the good news. Now, this is based on Isaiah. 52, verse 7, which says, How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, Your God reigns. It was part of the prophecy, and when it was originally written, that brought news of Israel's deliverance from Babylonian captivity. Later, it was used and applied to the coming of the Messiah. Uh, now, <laughs> Paul is using it really to apply to the spreading of the gospel. Because he was saying, how can anyone call on the one who they have not believed? And how can they believe if they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone talking to them or telling them about or preaching to them? Someone tell them about Jesus if they're not there, if they refuse to go. So the spreading of the gospel. And then he ends it with saying, uh, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. Um, beautiful, if you look at the definition, if you look it up in the... Uh, uh, Bible dictionary, beautiful, the, the Greek word here can also mean timely. So some translation may even use timely. Uh, how timely are the feet of those who bring good news? Sort of an interesting take. And I think what he's trying to say here by using this word is that it leaves you with the impression impression that the spreading of the gospel is a task of great importance. It's exceptional. That makes it beautiful. It's one of those things that is perfect. Beautiful. When you see sunrise, sunset, or different things, and you say, oh, how beautiful that is, you recognize it's significant. How beautiful it is. And he's saying it is also timely. We cannot just sit on our hands. We need to be spreading the gospel. It needs to be done now. 
It's an exceptional thing that needs to be done and done soon. So I would leave you with this thought. Paul has used a lot of the Old Testament to bring uh, or to show the Jews that had not had the salvation experience what these verses now mean and can be utilized to understand that righteousness is not going to come through being good and obeying a whole bunch of laws. That righteousness comes from the heart and the mouth in the salvation experience. From trusting Jesus Christ for your salvation. So he is trying to get the Jews that had not believed to understand what had happened, where they had stumbled, and to get them up and over the stumbling stone and realizing what was taking place with the gospel, and also giving the Christians in the Roman church some ways of discussing it with the Jews and relating to them and to their past experiences and all the things that God has done from being the chosen people to the giving of the law to all of these things so that they might be saved. So as we read these chapters, it impresses upon us today, 2,000 years later, that there are people who have never heard the gospel. There are people who maybe don't understand what the gospel really means. And it's incumbent upon us as Christians to take this beautiful and perfect um, faith that we have and share it in a way, in a timely way, to help people make that decision with their heart and their mouth to become Christians. So I'll leave you with that thought today. And like I said, I'm glad that I have been here the last four weeks. And I'm sure Kelly will do an outstanding job too. So uh, be praying for our church as we move uh, this Sunday to having services again between 9.30 and 10.30 uh, by reservation. And uh, hopefully in the next few weeks, we can actually sit down together and I'll be able to ask questions and be able to drink my coffee and we can have a shared experience in studying the gospel. So let me pray you out of here. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this time that we have together. I just pray for all of those who are watching and listening that these words will convict them of their need for you or imbue them with the spirit of telling others about your son. Guide us this week. Watch over us. Inspire us. Challenge us. And keep us safe and well. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.